I am Meru, and this is Modern Immigrant. Welcome everybody to a new episode of Modern Immigrant, the first episode of this new year. Happy 2023. I'm so excited to be here to continue to be together on another year. I wish you all the best for this year that is just starting and I hope we all get to continue to explore immigration and grow together as a community. I'm so, so excited and I know I always say the same, but I'm truly excited to share this immigration story for you all today. New York writer Annette is sharing her immigration story with us today. In this episode, we talk about Annette's immigration journey in three different continents and the impact of growing up being the daughter of survivors of the Holocaust. In this amazing conversation, we explore her writing career. We talk about her book, Aftermath, coming of age in three continents, and other amazing books she has written, even poetry. Annette touches on the challenges of being an immigrant, such as learning a new language, being away from family members, adapting to a new culture, and we talk about that survival mode that a lot of immigrants have to overcome and that also have to kind of get used to. I know a lot of you will relate to some of these amazing stories that Annette is sharing with us today. I'm going to leave Annette's website so you can go check out her work. You can go buy her books. And also, you should share this episode if you found it helpful. Remember that sharing episodes, um, it's an amazing way to connect with other immigrants, to support other people, and also to spread the word of this amazing, amazing immigration stories. Thank you so much for being here with us on another week. Remember, we're going to have um, new episodes every other week. So expect those episodes on Wednesday. But if you subscribe to our channel and if you subscribe to our podcast, whatever you're listening to, then you get a little notification to remind you whenever we have something new. Remember to follow us on Instagram at Modern Immigrant our, and our website, Modern Immigrant com for more information about what we're doing and more information on how to connect with our guests. Thank you so much one more time. Enjoy this interview. So here we are on another episode of Modern Immigrant. I'm so excited with today's interview with Annette. Annette, welcome to the show. Thank you, Vera. It's great to be with you. It's really nice to be with you as well. And I forgot to ask you if I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Yes, you are. Awesome. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll pronounce it for you, just uh, and for your listeners, maybe. Annette Liebeskind Berkowitz. Thank you so, so much. I'm really glad that we had the opportunity to connect and make this episode happen. And the way that we start the conversations here at Modern Immigrant, I really like to start by asking my guests when did the immigration journey start and when did they become an immigrant? And I know you're going to take us into an amazing journey of different places. So you tell us when, when. Okay. Well, I'll just start by saying that I, I am delighted that a person like you exists who explores the lives of immigrants because everybody's story is different and we can take a lesson from everybody's story. So thank you for doing this, Vera. And now to answer your question, when did I become an immigrant? Well, uh, since I was a baby, I feel like I've been an immigrant almost all my life. So I started life out in Kyrgyzstan. Uh, a lot of people don't know where it is. It, it's a country in Central Asia, uh, north of Afghanistan. I, I have to admit that I Google it when I read it in your book because I wasn't sure where it was. So I, I appreciate you telling us. It's a very remote place. Mm -hmm. uh, even in this modern day, it's still very remote. Uh, it was a village on at the foothills of the Himalayas. Uh, and, and the story of why I ended up uh, being born in that place is probably interesting in and of itself because it has to do with my parents' journey, mm -hmm. which is, uh, I will abbreviate at least at this point and say that uh, they were both prisoners Soviet uh, of the Soviet government in, in gulags. And when they were released from their imprisonment, they were so cold 
because they had no clothes. They were in Northern climates. My mother was in Siberia. So the people who managed to survive and many died, but they survived and they wanted to go as far South as possible to warm up. It was a simple wish just to be warm. And of course they got to the foothills of the Himalayas and they couldn't cross the Himalayas. So they remained there for a time and that's where they married and that's where I was born. Add, yeah, just just by starting this, I have already like so many questions and thoughts. And I truly appreciate that you say that your immigration story started when you were a baby or even before you were born, because it's a beautiful way to recognize our ancestors and our parents and where we come from, right? I don't think there's nobody that can say I'm from this one place only unless they're native. Um, and so that complexity, and I'm sure... I guess I would love to for you to you to speak about how was for you getting, you know, learning from your parents' story when you were born and you started to realize, okay, we're not technically from here, but my parents were fleeing from a very terrible situation. So how how when did you start to kind of learn these things? Well, I started to learn it when I was very young, which is unusual. Uh, first of all, uh, I, I learned it when we had to leave the home that I was born to. I was born in, in a village in Kyrgyzstan, and my first memories are those huge fields of poppies. There's a big poppy, a big opium growing area in Kyrgyzstan still till today. But really? to a child, the red poppies are so beautiful, mm. you don't understand what they're connected with. Right. But when I was two and a half, uh, my, my parents finally heard rumors that the war was over because they were so remote, they had no news where they were. So they decided to go back to Poland, which is their native country, uh, yeah. to, to find surviving relatives. Oh my God. And I was two and a half, so I was wrenched from my home. And at that time, 1946, was just after the war, and there were huge movements of people. People, uh, there's always movements of people after the war, people who escape, soldiers returning. So there was no normal, uh, so to speak, transportation. So my parents boarded a cattle train uh, and uh, we slept uh, on the floor of the cattle train. And it was probably such a dramatic change to a child, mm -hmm. which is probably why I remember it with such clarity as if it happened yesterday. And I remember it even more because my mother was pregnant with my brother. And so uh, in order to, this, this journey wasn't direct. You didn't get on the train and you get to where you were going. Right. Cattle train stopped for a day or two or a week and then moved again. And then it was routed a different way and so on. But the journey lasted three months before we came to Poland. So for me, that period is very vivid because my father mm -hmm. would jump off the cattle train when the train stopped and he would take a dented teapot and put it under the locomotive to catch the warm drippings of water that my mother used to wash me. And I remember that moment, those scenes very clearly. So yes, then we got to Poland and my parents of course embarked immediately on a search for their relatives. They had huge families that they left behind. Incidentally, those families refused to join them when they escaped Poland from the Nazis. But it was dangerous to do, they had to cross a river uh, at that time in 1939, where uh, the Nazi soldiers were on one uh, side of the river and the uh, Soviet soldiers on the other shooting at each other. So uh, crossing in a little rowboat across that river was taking your life into your hands. So their relatives said, you're crazy. We're, we're not doing this. Of course, as it happened, they all perished. But when my parents didn't know this, when they came back to Poland, they started looking for family. And of course, there was no one left. I can't imagine the shock and the, I don't know, you're, you're, I appreciate that you're sharing this with, with details for the listeners. And when, when you're talking about your parents going back to Poland after the war and after all this trauma and without knowing what they were going to 
encounter, it's almost like a second immigration in a way, right? Like leaving, they left yeah. behind a country and then they come back to the country that's no longer as they remember it. And the people that are there are not there anymore. And, and in a way, I feel like a lot of people that might be listening, I'm sure as immigrants, we can all connect in a way and have empathy for that feeling of, wow, I I don't know where I am anymore, even though it's my country technically. Exactly, exactly. And as it happened, <laughs> this is as, like as luck would have it, people's uh, histories are so interesting because of this. My mother gave birth to my brother on the day that we arrived. And we had no home. We had nowhere to go. So she gave birth to him in a homeless shelter. And I was left in a, in a big room with maybe 40 women that were just mm -hmm. sleeping there on cots. And eventually my father came. It's, 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 a, it's a long story how my parents got separated. Mm -hmm. And there was time I, I could tell it, but I could move on for now. Uh, so uh, when my father came, you know, he was trying to figure out, I have two children now and I have no home. So I, I think a lot of people who are immigrants can, can relate to this. Where, where am I going to live? And it so happened that he ran into a school friend of his on the street who he went to school with years before. He was with him in elementary school. Oh, and this wow. thing, bless his heart, a wonderful human being. He said, you don't have to worry about anything. You can come and live with me. And my wife, they were a childless couple. And my father said, so, so you have a big apartment? And he said, well, no, I just have one room. Oh my God. A big so, heart, but not a big apartment. He had one room. And I remember this room because we moved in with him. So this is two, he took two adults and two young children and a newborn infant, my brother, who was born with an ear infection. So he screamed and cried all the time because he was in such pain mm -hmm. and it was a long long dark corridor that I remember as a child mm -hmm. that had one toilet for the eight families on the floor okay so that's where we lived and thank goodness for this man because I don't know my, my parents would have been even more desperate than they were and then of course so that was their living situation wow and and, and then, yeah and then discovered that their family is gone. It's gone. Yeah. So, so I had to know about it. So it, it was obvious to me. What was obvious to me hmm. when I was very young yeah. was that all my school friends, you know, when they had a birthday party, they, they, they were family. There was aunts, there was uncles, there was cousins. I had nobody. So right away, as a child, you, you see the difference. You feel it. You know it. But my father happened to be one of those few survivors who talked about what happened. He talked about his experience and, and what happened to his family. And he decided he would tell my brother and me when we were very young kids. So I learned about the Holocaust when I was probably, I don't know, seven or eight or nine. And that's very rare. Because uh, many survivors talk about their experiences when they're old. Mm. You know, they want to convey to the grandchildren. Uh, but my father talked about it right away. And he felt it was his duty to bear witness and to pass on the story. And that's something that when you, I think it's in the beginning of your book, in the part where you're talking about the reason why you wrote it there is something that really caught my attention that you say that a lot of all of these experiences that you went through didn't completely click until you were an adult and you started looking back at your yeah. life and at your experiences and that aftermath which is the title of your book that we're also going to talk in just a little bit but you say that during that process and these experiences that you're talking that you remember very vividly, you also remember a family full of support and love and good memories and, and beautiful moments. So you're talking that about like how your 
dad was so upfront about the Holocaust and the situations that happened. How was that for you? Like listening to that traumatic event and how was, so one thing is to listen about it and learn. And then how was that for you growing up? And I don't know if my question makes any sense, but like how. I I understand your question and I, I've been thinking about how to answer it. And, you know, my answer is it's really good to look back at at my experience and think about it. And what I feel is that I saw my parents' pain, but it manifested itself in very different ways. Mm -hmm. My father would sing all the time. He was a great singer. He had a wonderful voice. He was very musical. So he would sing, and I would say to him sometimes, you sing so much, why do you sing so much? And, and he said, that's, that's, uh, that's how Jews uh, keep pain at bay, or, or that's how w- we used to sing when we were hungry, and that would you know, fill up our stomachs. My mother, on the hand, was at the other end of the spectrum. She was very depressed. She was often in a dark room with the shades drawn, uh, my father saying, quiet, quiet, shh. Okay, don't make any noise you know she was she was in a in a very different state than my father yeah and i think that realization as a child it wasn't conscious mm. but i feel now looking back that i felt i had to be very good that i couldn't do anything yeah. to upset my parents especially my mother to add more pain i could see she was in pain and I didn't want to do anything, quote unquote, bad, whatever bad. child was bad. So I, I had mm-hmm. to be the good girl. I had to bring the best grades because that mm-hmm. would make them happy or that would pull them out of the sadness, maybe a little bit. Right, right. So that's how it manifested itself, I think. Yeah. And it's like a, to carry some sort of like a very big responsibility for a child, right? To To like know that your parents are in pain, like when you realize that it's hard, like, okay, how do I deal with this? And I know that, uh, well, I want to hear first what happened after Poland, because I know that you ended up moving to the U.S. as a teenager. So maybe walk us through that. And then I'm going to ask you a little bit more on trauma and how I was growing up. Okay. So um, in 1957, uh, there was uh, a wave of immigration uh, from Poland of Jewish people when the government policies were, were, loosened, were loosened a bit. Because before, a lot of people don't realize this. I know when I talk to my grandchildren, they're like, why couldn't you leave before? Well, you couldn't because the government said you can't leave. <laughs> right. It seems so, it seems absurd. This, well, well it seems you just buy a ticket and you leave. Right. right? <laughs> The young people who are not exposed to it don't know. You live in a communist country, you need to get permission to leave. And if the government doesn't give you permission, you don't go. So the government actually did a, a very ugly harassment tactic, which is they would issue exit visas at certain periods of time, and people would start you know, giving, giving up their jobs or selling their possessions. And then the government revoked the visa. Sorry, you can't go. So this happened to my parents, I think, four or five times. And by the time they got the exit visa in 1957, there was this huge rush to leave quickly before something might change, because you don't know. So, you know, I remember these huge wooden crates appeared in our living room, and my parents were just throwing everything in, and and that was it. And How I, old were you by then? I was 13 and a half, so I was fully cognizant of what was happening. And I can't say that I was very sad leaving Poland because I had no family there. We had a nanny that I loved dearly, and she was the only person I thought I would miss. And then, you know, my parents told me there there was family in Israel. And this is family I knew only from stories. So, of course, I didn't know these people, but right. my parents had told me, well, actually, my mother, because my father didn't have any relatives in Israel. My mother had 
two sisters that had gone to settle Palestine before it was Israel. Yeah. So that's how they survived. So they, so they were living there all along. And she had one brother, who, her youngest sibling, actually, who survived Auschwitz and after the war was somehow shipped to Israel. So she had three siblings wow. in Israel. And it, to her, it was the most thrilling thing in the world. You know, she had lost all the rest of the family, her mother, her four younger sisters, and so countless aunts and uncles. And there she was coming to two sisters. Wow. So she was happy. My father was not happy. Mm. I didn't know how I felt. Mm. So we arrived in this strange country. Israel and Poland are like the opposite ends of, of a spectrum. Oh, okay. so you went to Israel before you moved to the U.S.? Oh, yes, yes. Okay, yes. thank you. Amazing. Yes. Okay. yes. How is that different? Yeah. How is it was Everything, you know, from the color of the sky, the, the heat. I mean, it was, it was just shocking because Poland is a northern country, rather cool. Uh, skies are often gray, not always, of course, but we came in May of 1957, and it was hot, and the sky was so blue, and there were palm trees that I had never seen. It was wow. everything that I saw was something that I had never seen, and the thing that really kind of surprised me in a, in a pleasant way, there were people with faces that I had never seen because Poland's very monolithic country, white people. Maybe it's changed now, but it's certainly then no diversity. The only person with a black face that I had ever seen. When Paul Robeson, the singer, he was a yeah. big singer in, in, in the 50s, a wonderful singer. Amazing. He came to visit Poland. And I remember he was in my city and hundreds of people just ran after him on the street because they had never seen someone with a dark face. So that was the only uh, experience in Poland. But when we came to Israel, there had been a huge wave of immigrations of mm -hmm. uh, uh, Libyan Jews, Jews from Morocco, Tunisia, Algeria, Yemen, there were people of different shades. And they were right. there. And I was like, oh my God, they are Jewish. And and I, I'm not only I was the only Jewish uh girl in in, in my building. We lived in a large uh apartment building in yeah. Poland. We were the only Jewish people, and, and suddenly uh we, we were just amazed that we were like in this place where there were many people like us and there's so was, all this community that was able to now feel well that they were feeling a different experience there than the one you probably heard from your parents as being jewish back then versus in this place it was totally uh, and then they were as we got off the ship all these people came running up to us and hugging us and we didn't know anybody and these were aunts and uncles and cousins and it was such an overwhelming experience, literally overwhelming. Mm -hmm. But um, our first stop in Israel, uh, mm -hmm. the government had built these, um, I'll call loosely accommodations uh, for, for newcoming immigrants. And there were many. It was not easy for the country to deal with them. So right, right. we were put in a little, I don't know, like a wooden shack. <laughs> in the desert and uh, uh it was like it was like being on the moon and my mother's sister uh who was one of the founders of a kibbutz in, in northern israel she came and she looked at my mother she said you can't stay here so they borrowed a ve they borrowed a vehicle from the kibbutz and they brought us to the kibbutz which is you know a farm and uh, wow. that's again, you know, I've never been on a farm. You know, there were cows suddenly. Oh, around. Where am I? It was it was a very shocking experience. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, we stayed for a, a couple of nights with with my aunt and, and her husband, who had all of one one room. Mm -hmm. You know, a terrace, a one room, and and a bathroom. Wow. And they went to stay overnight in some friend's house and they let us stay there a couple of nights and then suddenly I heard to my great shock my mother talking with her sister saying we, we can't stay here we, you know we've displaced you from your bed we're going to Tel Aviv just oh. in the city mm -hmm. we, we have to 
find a place to live and we have to find jobs. So, uh, you know, I was like, and what about me and my brother? Where, where are we going to be? And, and my mother said, don't worry, you're going to stay here with your aunt. And that terrified me. Why? Because uh, children did not stay with their families in the kibbutz. Mm. So I knew I was going to have to go into the house with, you, you know, the young girls and boys my age. But, you know, when you're 13 and a half, mm. you're suddenly going to be thrown with a group of strange teens yeah. and you don't speak their language. From another country, right. Oh. What are you going to do? So it's terrifying. My parents left us. My parents left us. My brother got put in, uh, you know, with his age group with mm. kids his age. And after, I don't know, I think I was maybe a week with my aunt. Who, who was my savior because she spoke Polish and I didn't speak any other language and I would follow her like, like a puppy oh. and, and I could keep saying you know auntie how do you say this in Hebrew and and she would like uh, try and guide me and then after maybe it was a week and then 10 days I can't remember she said well that's it you're going to the children's house I said but you're not going to be with me how will I know how to right Right. Communicate. How will I know? She said, don't worry, your cousin will help. You know, it so happened she had a daughter, my cousin uh, Ruthie, who was exactly my age. We were born like two weeks apart, but we couldn't communicate. Oh. No language. It was all sign language. And it's so hard. <laughs> I'm getting like the I'm feeling the, the anxiety. It was hard. It was, it was you know, even now looking at it in retrospect uh the whole idea and don't forget i came from a home now it, it was interesting in poland we weren't rich but we weren't poor either we had a very small apartment because after the war there, there were no places for people to live so we lived in a one-bedroom apartment a small one-bedroom apartment uh and and that was but financially my mother had her own business we went on vacations and and I was, in some ways, very spoiled because we had yeah. the nanny. Mm -hmm. And she was, you know, then suddenly I get thrown into this kibbutz. And it's like, you're on your own. You mean nobody's going to wash my clothes? Right. What do I do now? Nobody's going to tie my shoes? <laughs> it was a shocking experience. Yeah. It is. It is a shock. Yeah. It, it was. It was a shock. And uh so we were, uh, finally, we were there two years, and I okay. came to learn Hebrew and speak fluently and go to school and love the language and just nice. be in love with the place. Mm. And then suddenly, boom. Again. Again, have to leave. Why? Why do you have to leave? My mother is happy. She has our business. Mm. Everything is fine. My father, you cannot live there. Why? A lot of people are very surprised to hear. And this is the story. And I think a lot of immigrants really appreciate this. My father was raised in pre-war Poland. He went to the a school to run uh, as socialists, hmm. uh, but it was a, a Yiddish language school. So Yiddish was his language at home, and Yiddish, it was the first school that taught uh, in English. He was in the first class. Mm -hmm. Yiddish was the language of the school. Uh, so, you know, Yiddish was his mother tongue. Mm -hmm. And in the post-war Poland, he couldn't, mm -hmm. he couldn't speak Yiddish because you would be in big trouble. So he couldn't speak his mother tongue, and he couldn't wait to get to Israel to finally speak his mother tongue. And Yiddish at that time in Israel was complete anathema. People would basically tell him, shut up. Why? Because they were trying to, you know, forge a new culture with Hebrew. And my father didn't know Hebrew. Hebrew was only used in Poland. Jewish people use Hebrew only for prayers. Okay. It was not a spoken language. Yeah. It was the language of the Bible. Mm -hmm. The spoken everyday language was Yiddish. So my father thought he come to Israel 
that it would be the same. Language, but it wasn't, number one. And number two, which is probably bigger than all, my father had worked all his life, very hardworking man. In Israel, he was, let's see, I think he was 47. He was too old. They told him he was too old. Why? Because Israel and uh, when the country, you know, right after independence, it wasn't even the 10th anniversary of the country. They needed young people to build the country. People in their 40s were considered over the hill. And he didn't speak the language. And he had been an administrator. So, you know, what skills did he have? He had skills as an administrator. If you don't have a language, he how can you use it, right? Use it. So he couldn't work. He couldn't speak his language. Yeah. And the biggest factor, he found out, and not right away, but eventually he found out that his the only member of his family that survived Auschwitz was his sister who was living in Pennsylvania in the United States. And he wow. was he would have he was very close with her, the two closest in age siblings. Mm -hmm. And he really and she said, You've got to come to America. So uh, and here you'll have a house and you'll have a job and you know this is America. You will have everything. The American dream. Mm -hmm. You'll have the American dream. So what does he do? He was he was very conflicted, but not conflicted enough that he didn't apply for the visa. He applied for an exit visa. But at that time, you could only apply as one person. You could not apply for the family. Oh. So when, when my mother was devastated by this. She person, didn't want to leave, right? She didn't want to leave. And I didn't want to leave. Mm -hmm. I loved Israel. I had a boyfriend. Oh. Uh, I had friends. I. I was horrified at the notion of leaving. And you were already like had to go through that yeah. simulation process. You adapted, you learned the language. It's like the worst nightmare for an immigrant is to hear that you have to do it all over again. Yes. And and finally you're you're set, right? You're mm. happy. Yeah. My father now, my father and I were extremely close. So seeing my father leave right. broke my heart because we didn't know whether we would ever be able to get a visa for us to leave, whether he would be able to bring us to America, A, we didn't know, and B, we didn't really want it. And my father said, uh, I have to do it. I, I said to my father, you know, if you can't get a visa for us, are you going to come back? And his, he said, I remember this like yesterday, only a goat walks, walks backwards. I'm not doing backwards anything. I'm staying there. Don't worry, I'll bring you. So I knew that if he doesn't get the visa, we're going to be separated as a family. And that would be a tragedy oh, so. for us because we had been a very close-knit family. So it was a, a very difficult period of time. That's so hard. And yeah, it, at the time, it took about, I think, nine months before okay. he managed to get visas for us. But That's all that time... time. It's a lot, but all that time we didn't know. So right. every day we thought it could be nine years or it could and be And the, communi the communication, I'm sure it was also a challenge and, and receiving communication from how is he doing? How's the visa processing? Like, I can't even imagine. How was that? Well, that's, I'm glad you brought that up because I think it's an interesting story. When he left, he promised us that he would write to us every day and we promised that we would write every day. And believe it or not, we did that. And my father saved all the letters. And I have a huge stack of all the letters, which I plan one day if I have time to translate, because I think it's a fascinating story, so a, an immigrant story, like on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah. Yes. Uh, but what happened when you said it was difficult to communicate, you're absolutely right, because it was expensive to pay postage to america so we only used do you remember the aerograms those thin blue sheets no. that you fold up I oh yes yes of course yes. yeah okay so we only yeah. so uh we would uh, designate a, a a piece of the page for mm -hmm. me 
for my brother and for my mother because we and we rode all the way up to the edge. Oh, my we God. always warned each other, you know, be very careful when you open it because you're going to cut off some of the text. So cute. Oh. Okay. So, right. Yeah. So hmm. so we wrote every so we wrote every day, but it was That's hard. Amazing. You couldn't make a phone call. Who could afford a phone call to America? Out of the question. Right, right. The writing was the only way to kind of cope with that yeah. emotional hardship of not having your dad close to you, not knowing what was going to happen. Well, yes. And he was, he, it turned out, uh, I, I wrote this in another book and I'll mm-hmm. talk about this later, but yeah, uh, when my father came to New York, he had no place to stay. And he found school friends from that school that I mentioned that were so close. They, they were like siblings. Yes. And they each, uh, they, they fought over who he would stay with because they all wanted him to stay with them. Yeah. That was a, a, had a very easygoing personality. So he would stay a week with this one and a week with that one and a week oh. with that one. But it, w- it was hard. I mean, he, he never complained about it, but my mother always said, you know, he's what, what kind of life is it? He has to go from one sofa to another. I think a lot of immigrants can relate to that mm-hmm. when you have no place, yeah. and, you know, and when he went out to look for a job, his friends would make him, you know, a sandwich and he would walk around mm-hmm. with a sandwich. His life was hard. So we were very yeah. worried about him when we were in Israel from the letters. So we, we knew right. Uh, not that he ever complained. He thought it was fantastic. He was in the golden land. He was happy, but we were worried about him. And that's such a beautiful, sometimes I, th- I I see that as in the immigrants that I interview, in the immigrants, in my own experience and with my family, that's also an immigrant. You know, like we have this capacity, resiliency to just keep going. It's survival, is thinking about your family, is... You know, I'm always like an advocate to open up about your struggles and asking for help. But at the same time, I understand that we're sometimes in positions where we just have to keep going. And we are very grateful for people that opened their house to receive us and support us. It's difficult, but we're there. We know that the other option, it's not an option. Exactly. You're so So, right. I mean, the key word is survival. You have to survive. yeah. 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 And so how was arriving to the U.S. as a teenager, if you can summarize oh, that experience, oh learning a new language, again, an immigrant? It was, it was, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a little story. Yeah. Okay. So when we finally had to leave, it was, it was this, one of the saddest moments of my life to leave my family. They all brought us, you know, to the dock. They were all very disappointed with us because Jews who finally made it to Israel and left after two years, you know, uh, I, I thought they were thinking of us as traitors. Uh, so, but, you know, all these tears, all, everybody crying at the boat. And finally, we we got on the SS Constitution, a very big, beautiful uh, ocean liner, except uh, our... Our cabin was in the bowels of the ship. Wow. Uh, and uh, my brother and I brought um, uh, uh, like, a, I think it was a Hebrew English dictionary. We tried to learn some words. We thought on the voyage we would learn some words. Yeah. So my, my brother was always teasing. <laughs> and he has a great sense of humor. Always had it, still has it. Oh. And, and he would say, uh, let's make a bet. Uh, if you learn a sentence uh, in English, I'm, I'm going to want to listen to you say it to, to an English speaker on this ship. Uh, and so he yeah. challenged me. So, uh, so That's the I, best way to learn. So <laughs> They yes, tell you, so you I, go and ask for it. <laughs> yeah. So I tried. So I, I, learned, I, learned my, my, I learned my sentence. I thought I was very proud of myself. I was able to say, do you, do you speak English? And I thought, okay. So he came up on the deck with me. Yeah. And, and I tried to pick out someone who I thought was definitely American. <laughs> I, you wanted okay. them to understand what you, what you were yeah, saying. It was, notion, it was my notion of yeah. who an American. 
and there was a big man, tall man. He wore boots. He had like a cowboy hat, like a Texan hat, <laughs> and a big shiny buckle on his belt. And I thought, this must be an American. So I go over to this man, and I was, uh, this is, uh, I'm not quite 16. This is before my 16th birthday. Okay. And I'm very shy to begin with. I'm no longer very shy, by the way, but I was very, <laughs> I was very, very yeah. shy then. And I a- approached him like very nervously. And I said, do you, do, do you, do you speak English? And he looked at it. He, he must have thought it was funny. It was like cute or funny. Yeah. He said, a young lady, I speak American. <gasps> And I was horrified. I thought, oh, my God, there's another language. We didn't study the right language. And I ran away. And my brother was in hysterics. He was laughing so hard. Oh, my goodness. He said, see, we're studying the wrong language. (laughs) We weren't planning for this scenario to happen. (laughs) And as funny as that is, as funny as that is, is is in a way is true. Like learning English is one thing. Yes. And then (laughs) Speaking English in the U.S. is a completely different experience. Like I had to go through that. You're like, what are those words? What's that accent? What? And it so happened that we arrived at the very end of August. So school starts like right after Labor Day, right? So school had to start and we didn't speak English. We didn't speak any English except that one miserable sentence. (laughs) And um, yeah, and I ended up. Uh, There was um, a woman uh, who was, she was a friend of a friend who volunteered to take me to register for high school. Mm. Wow. And of course I spoke, she spoke Polish. I spoke Polish to her. Right. And uh, we were on our way to register in the Bronx, uh, Walton High School, a big, big high school. Mm. So we were on the way. To, to go into th- that school. And we passed a beautiful new building. And I was making conversation. I mean, I didn't know the woman. I was feeling uncomfortable. Uh, you know, a 16-year-old going with a, you know, 60-year-old right. lady. And I said, what is this building? And she said, oh, it's nothing. And I thought that answer was so weird. I said, right. what do you mean? And I said, oh, my God, it's so beautiful. Wait one minute. And I ran up the steps. There's like shallow steps. And I saw before me a gorgeous mural. Wow. And I immediately knew what it was because it was a, it was a it was a big controversial project at the time in New York City. It was yeah. a brand new building built for the Bronx High School of Science. I don't know if you ever heard of it, but it was at the time like the, the top uh, public school in America. And wow. they built this multi-million dollar mural that had scientists in it. And I recognized Marie Curie because she was my hero in Poland. And I ran back to the lady. I said, oh, this building is something to do with science. And she said, well, yes, it's it's a high school. I said, a high school? I want to go to this school. And she said, no, no, you can't. I don't like to hear you can't. (laughs) I said, why not? And she said, well, you have to take an entrance exam. I said, oh, can I do it? She said, no, no, these exams are given in the spring. So you can't. And I started bugging her to take me into the building. Please take me in to see the, the director. It was a principal. I called it the director. All right. And well, this is amazing. Your readers will find out from there how I made it into the school. Yeah, because I know, I mean, my life. When you said science, I was like, wait a second. I know that's like, the field you went to. <laughs> so that's amazing. Yeah, and it led me yeah. to my career and a lot of other yeah. things. It yeah. was a very crucial moment. And it wasn't until much later that I found out this lady's daughter had taken the test for the school and didn't make it. Uh, so, so For she, her, it was a nothing. <laughs> it was okay. well, yeah. yeah. Now I understand even better. But there was, you know, I went in on the first day of school. I had my homeroom card. It was a building with a lot of wings. Mm. It's kind of a modern building at the time with a lot lot of wings. Mm. And I have a terrible sense of direction. 
And uh, I, I had no idea what the numbers on my card meant. It probably said like Northeast or Northwest or whatever. Right, right. And I didn't know how to find my homeroom. And, you know, the bell rang, the first bell. And, you know, students disappear. <gasps> and the second bell and the halls, you could hear a pin drop. Everybody's in their room. I'm standing there. I don't know how to ask. I'm crying like, like right. an idiot. You know, I feel so, you know, yeah. 16 years old, you can't find your classroom. You don't know how to ask. It's a miserable feeling. Right. So yeah. I was standing there weeping. And a man comes down the hall. And as it turned out, he was my homeroom teacher. He looked at my card and he, he sort of put his arm around my shoulder and said, come with me, I guess. And oh, just the uh, communication. Yeah. It, communication was, it was, it was a huge challenge, huge challenge. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, the English language is so different from Polish and mm -hmm. Hebrew. And they all are so different from one another. Yeah. It's, it's not easy. What do you think? And, and I know this is a broad question, but what do you think are the challenges, the most common challenges that you experience as an immigrant in, in different, in those different scenarios? Well, languages would be mm -hmm. the first language, yeah. culture also, yeah. customs. Um, <laughs> one example of just culture and customs. <laughs> when I was on the ship uh, coming over from Israel to New York, uh, the seas were terrible. A lot of people were very seasick. Mm -hmm. And so was I. So my brother, who's <laughs> very sweet, he used to go for breakfast. I wouldn't dream of it because I was so nauseated. Right. He would bring me this little box of things uh, that I thought were like potato chips, but they were really cornflakes. Oh, <laughs> and I was, oh, they have such small, delicate potato chips in America. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> the thing, you know, uh, yeah, the that's such a, that's the best like example you could have given us because I feel like we're all gonna immediately think about that one thing that for us was like, <laughs> how do they eat this? <laughs> These little potato chips. Yeah. But um was was there anything that you think helped you with learning a new language, learning English? You had to like had to learn so many different languages languages throughout your life and adapt to a different culture. What had helped you in the process? I will tell you. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, what helps you first is what you talked about before, is survival. You have to survive. So you have to do something. Yeah. And um, I, I was very fortunate uh, in Israel that I was thrown in with that group of kids my age mm -hmm. who spoke not a word of Polish. And I just had to, you know, I, I had to be courageous in the sense that I had to say things I knew were incorrect like I, I you know I, yeah. I, I, knew I was making a fool of myself saying things that I knew were wrong yeah. but that's the only way I could express myself mm -hmm. and you, you know uh, my cousin would go around pointing at things and saying what what the name of the object was in Hebrew yeah. and then you know I put the words together in a broken way feeling very embarrassed, but feeling like I have to do it. Otherwise, you do make it. But also, uh, I, I had uh, the lucky thing happened twice, both in Israel and the U.S. In Israel, uh, my father um, ran into a friend who was a survivor from the Soviet Gulag, who my father helped survive. Wow. Uh, and he was so grateful to my father, he wanted to do anything for him. And my father said, I did what any normal human being uh, would do. There's nothing to thank me for. It's, it, I'm just glad to see you. And that's that. But this man was so grateful that he hired a tutor for me. Wow. He hired a tutor, which, you know, my parents couldn't, couldn't think of affording, uh, as it turned out, this tutor was the assistant principal of the high school that I went to. Oh. 
Oh, wow. And there's a very long story about him in the book. I don't know if you got to finish the book. No, I haven't. I'm in the okay. in the mist. Yeah. I won't I won't tell you what happened. Please to don't. <laughs> the, story, the story with this assistant principal. Amazing. Went, uh, yes. It's a it's a complicated story. Okay. Yeah. So I had someone to help me there. Okay. And when I came to the US, amazingly. I had an English teacher at the Bronx High School of Science. If any of your listeners are Bronx Science graduates, and I know they're all over the country, his name was mm -hmm. Mr. Shore, and he would stay after school. Not many teachers do this. Mm -hmm. He'd say, "Come after classes, and you know, we'll do some exercises, and I'll help you." And that was, and that was amazing. That that's that helped so me. So, That's so but also uh, I, I had a friend, I didn't have many friends because I was so shy and I was really um, nervous about speaking English because I thought, you know, my, I might slip up with Polish right. or when, <laughs> right. but I had one friend who was very supportive and encouraging. So having at least one person who can uh, kind of um, help you through yeah. is very important. Yeah. Of course, I always had family support. By the way, I should say, in terms of learning the language, what what encouraged me too is that my parents were already fifty. You know, they were not they were not old. Yeah, <laughs> right. And now they were young. <laughs> right. At that time, they seemed old to me. Right. They <laughs> Things changed. Yeah. Uh, they both had uh, mm -hmm. jobs, uh, very very difficult jobs, hard labor jobs. But one day my mother said, okay, uh, we have to uh, wrap up dinner because we're going to school. I said, you're going to school? What school? Well, we're going to take English classes. And they wow. went to night classes mm -hmm. and, and my parents would tape little pieces of paper to objects, house, um, yeah. the names, you know, mm -hmm. cabinet, uh, whatever, pot, pans, uh, soup spoon, whatever. Yes. So, uh, and I was thinking, wow, you know, they they are willing to take the challenge of learning the language. And interestingly, my mother always felt that she, her English wasn't good enough, but she wanted to write in English. Oh, wow. She collected English, uh, Polish dictionaries. That's amazing. She really wanted to learn the language. And my father was... My father was one always say, don't worry about speaking with mistakes. Just talk. Just, just talk. do it. Yeah. He said, Americans are very forgiving. Just they, they're not like the French. <laughs> <laughs> they won't get offended if you yeah. man, manhandle their language. And they <laughs> will understand. That's such a good <laughs> advice. Loosen the fear. True. By the way, it's not true in every country. True. You try to speak uh French poorly in France that the French won't appreciate that mm -mm, you're not but gonna in, like that in America it's fine yeah I think we're getting more used to that and hopefully more and more to listen into accents and you know not a perfect English and um, I would really love to talk about your book because that's how we connected the aftermath and there's there's a quote um, right at the beginning where you say that you were shaped by the aftermath of the Holocaust. And you started to realize how being a survivor's children of the Holocaust has shaped you. How can we find, yeah, how, how it has shaped you? I know it's, it's a very big question to answer and I know part of your book is for us to learn that. But what would you like to share in this space about your book and about those experiences? What I would like to share probably uh, first and foremost is that adults uh, assume that children should be spared certain difficult information, mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, I think adults forget, or maybe they don't know, that children are very resilient. If the information is presented well in the proper context, yeah. in a non-threatening way, and if and if there's love and support in the family, uh, then uh, then that 
information becomes more digestible to the child. Uh, so when my father was telling me about uh, his brothers and sisters and nieces and nephews that were murdered, he wouldn't focus on the murder part. He would talk about how interesting they were. He told me about a nephew of his that at 14 was a fabulous artist mm. and how he wanted to escape to the gulag with my father. And he told me about a sister of his who loved to read and how she used to or read with a candle on the floor, uh, uh, you know, even, even though uh, the parents said her eyes were bad and she couldn't stay up late. Mm -hmm. And he told me the books that she read and his other sister, what a beautiful singing voice she had. And so he mm -hmm. made people alive in my mind. Uh, so, you know, they lived in my, in my consciousness. And so I didn't see them as dead people, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, he 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 did a, I think a, a marvelous job of telling me the story without terrifying me. Right, right. Uh, um, yeah, yeah. Did you ever started to see as you were growing up, you know, all of your experiences with migrations, with living in different countries and cultures? Did you ever started to see your own responses? from the trauma you have been exposed or from listening to your parents' trauma? Was there any signs that you were like, hmm, I'm kind of, this is what's happening. This is the aftermath. Uh, a few things. First of all, I, I, I felt that it was my responsibility to pass the information on mm. uh, to others through writing, uh, certainly to my children and grandchildren. Uh, I didn't want them to discover this, you know, many decades after I was gone. I wanted them to know their family's history and how, how to, that connects them to their roots. Mm -hmm. And that's why I wrote uh, the books that I wrote, because, because I think it's interesting to people of all cultures. Uh, 100%. So, yes, but it also, I think, has made me more sensitive uh, to issues of of loss and pain and uh, of of other people, other cultures, yeah. and more interested in it, and more interested, yeah. And I'm well, sure when you write your books, do you feel like in a way it's like healing, therapeutical for yourself as well, like remembering these stories, bringing them back. I wonder if that. It's difficult. Yes. It's painful. Yes, it it is the, it is therapeutic in that sense. Uh, uh, the the book that I wrote, um, my the memoir about my father and my own differences of opinion uh, on on various issues. Uh, I, I was playing his. He narrated his life story uh, in Yiddish, which was his language. But then yeah. he thought, just in case his grandchildren didn't know Yiddish. <laughs> but also narrated in English. So I have two complete versions of his story. So much work. Yeah. And I was uh, listening to it and writing and it, it was very healing, of course. Yeah. Write, writing, writing is very healing. I love that. And you also have poems and how many books in total? I would love for listeners to go check them out and look for them. Okay, so uh, I will start with my first book. My first book uh, is titled In the Unlikeliest of Places. Uh, the subtitle is How Nachman Liebeskin, that's my father, survived uh, the Nazis, uh, the gulags, and Soviet communism. It's an amazingly inspirational story. Uh, it's not, you know, some people say, oh, Nazis, Holocaust. Uh, I yeah. Don't know. Well, people I've had, I had uh, one particular reader write uh, on, to me through my website saying, yeah. this is such an inspirational story. I read it every year and I read and I insist that my grandchildren read it because it's because my my father uh, was a very musical person. He became um, 
a musician and, and an artist late in life based on all yeah. of his experiences. And he was just, uh, my daughter used to say that he could make friends with a lamp pole. I mean, <sighs> he, 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 he befriended people. <laughs> I, I love the story. He was uh, calling the telephone company about his bill. Yeah. Uh, and he had a chat with the lady that was handling his case. And he told <laughs> her about his uh, art exhibit. And sure enough, I said, this person that came to the show, I didn't know who she was. I said, Dad, who is this? She said, oh, this is the lady I met. In eight <laughs> Amazing. And no. I like, he was an extremely warm, friendly person. So... His story is amazing. He did find himself in, in the unlikeliest of places. He was unjustly imprisoned a couple of times uh, and, and how he overcame that and his, his emphasis on friendships. Uh, yeah. That's so beautiful. That was beautiful. I would love to read it. Yeah. Yes, it's you, you would enjoy it, I'm, I'm sure, because uh, I, I get so many reviews uh, that are very, very positive. Now, this book was written based yeah. on um, the tapes that he left with the narration of his story, but he didn't tell me that he narrated the story. So it wasn't until three years after he passed away, I was cleaning out his closet because he was living with us. And I found this shoe box and I thought it was, you know, like a pair of old shoes, but it was <gasps> tapes. No. I, oh my God. I thought it was, it was like my inheritance. I was terrified that they were drying out and I had them, you know, done into uh, converted yeah. CDs. Yeah. And Good. It's, it, it was like a treasure. And I felt like, okay, this is my uh, orders, marching orders to start writing. Uh, what and a beautiful I, gift that he did that. Like that would be amazing to find. It's my best in inheritance. But what I started writing, is so I was like overwhelmed by the whole story. And then there was the story of our migrations. And so I started writing a story. And I, and I wrote this gigantic book <laughs> they called Bitter Olives, because the olives in Israel uh, are an emblematic of my experience. I had never tasted or seen an olive in my life. When I came to Israel and I tasted an olive, when I said to my aunt, these things are green, they're not ripe. She said, no, no, you eat them like this. That's how they are. <laughs> and I tasted it and it was bitter and horrible. And I thought, okay, it's, it's a perfect name. Perfect name. So yeah. I called it Bitter Olives. I sent it off to my editor. And he said, I'm sorry to say you have four books in here. This is not one book. <laughs> That's so amazing. That's amazing. So, so first I wrote uh, yeah. my father's story. Yeah. And um, then, incidentally, that story was uh, translated uh, into Polish uh, two years ago by the Center of Dialogue and in Poland, where they uh, discuss issues of Polish, Jewish, and German culture. Very, very interesting uh, organization. So yeah. there's a version of this book in Polish. Okay. And if you have any Polish listeners, it's called In Polish... Życie pełne barw. That means a life full of color. What a beautiful name. Because my father was a very colorful person, as were his paintings. That's okay, amazing. so uh, then um, while I was waiting for feedback from my editor on my, on my final draft, yeah. I was very nervous because it was my first book and I had a publisher. Right. And I was very, very anxious. And my husband said, Stop being anxious. Just write about your work life. And I said, "Oh no, I, I don't. I don't think I have enough there for a book." And he said, "Just write one story. You've spent thirty plus years working with wildlife and animals at the Bronx Zoo in New York, and traveling all over the world. You have plenty of stories." So I said, "Okay." So, <laughs> and he so was right. <laughs> I'm driving him nuts. I wrote my first story, and he read it, and he loved the story. He said, "See." You have more stories. Write the second story. Amazing. <laughs> and eventually those stories became confessions of an accidental zoo curator. Because I, I became a curator. And believe it or not, I became a curator by accident. <laughs> How does a girl growing up terrified of animals 
have anything to do in a professional life with wildlife. No, no, this is amazing. <laughs> I saw it on your website and I was like, I can't was wait to hear why. <laughs> Even till this day, I can't be in a, in a, in a room with a domestic cat. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love this. This gives me hope. I mean, there's hope and getting into fields that we never thought we were going to be. Exactly. Never in my wildest dreams would I have ended up at the yeah. Bronx Zoo and, and, and doing programs, you know, Amazing. with countries around the world. So uh, there there is a lot of behind the scenes stories about how a wildlife conservation organization works yeah. and behind the scenes at the zoo. Uh, so some of the stories are, are funny, very funny. Nice. Uh, like including like a Yiddish speaking bird that I came across at the Bronx Zoo. Yes, it's true. It's I'm, I bet. <laughs> I bet. But I love that. Uh, had a had a very dirty vocabulary. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's uh, so, so funny. So, so that was Confessions of an Accidental okay. Zoo Writer, and. Uh, during that period, uh, a tragedy in our lives uh, happened. Uh, our adult son uh, suffered a hemorrhagic stroke and uh, he was a father of two young children. And um, uh, the consequence of it, the, the long and the short of this is that his mind works well, but he cannot move anything. He's completely quadriplegic, he re requires 24 seven care. And, and as a mother, I was so devastated. Yeah. I mean, any parent would be, and, and, and I wrote poetry to, as a healing process mm -hmm. for myself, uh, but my, my poetry editor saw it and he said, you know, this, this can help any, anybody in pain heal. So mm -hmm. he, he suggested the publication of my poetry book and wow. I titled it, it has a Greek title, strangely enough. It's called Erythra Thalassa, Rain Disrupted. And Erythra Thalassa in Greek means Red Sea. And that's exactly the image that I had of my son's brain when the blood spill all over the brain, like the Red Sea opened in his head. So yeah. I titled it that. So that's the poetry book for anybody who is in pain yeah. and, and needs to see healing. Thank you. Yeah. And then, of course, I, I wrote uh, Aftermath, uh, my, my own uh, story of coming of age on, on three continents. Uh, and now I'm almost finished. I decided I like to challenge myself in different genres. Mm. So okay. I, I'm writing a magical realism novel uh, that takes place during the pandemic in New York. Oh, I love that. Those are my like my favorite types of books to read. Yeah. So okay. I'm gonna keep post I'm gonna keep in touch with the website so I know okay. when it's out. I, I will I will share it with you when it's Please. ready. Um, and I'm trying to get it done because I already have an idea for a sequel. Oh, how could I forget? My <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh God, I'm too many books. Uh and in just this past March. Yes, uh, Amsterdam Publishing released my my first novel, uh, The Corset Maker. The Corset Maker is based, it's inspired by, it's not based on, it's inspired by my mother, who was in fact a corset maker. But The Corset Maker is a story of a young woman who breaks out of her traditional culture in the 1930s. And the story takes her from pre-war Poland uh, to Palestine, to the Spanish Civil War, uh, to post-war, uh, not post-war, pre-war and during the war and post-war Paris. And, and the story is based on my mother and three of her friends. And these are wow. based on things that actually happened to them. And, Amazing. Uh, it's, it's a very complex story uh, that looks at love in different forms. Mm -hmm. It talks about uh, a woman's courage uh, to, to, to lead her own authentic life. And uh, that's, well, so that, that's how I came, you know, magical realism is my next step after this right. historical novel. So The Corset Maker is a historical mm -hmm. novel that came out uh, this March. Awesome. And I, uh, memoir is coming out in September, so I'll have 
two book releases in one year, which is that's amazing. Quite a lot. <laughs> Congratulations on just writing and creating and sharing your stories and sharing your inspirations. I I really admire. I really admire that. You know, I was thinking uh, y- you were talking about what what is the impact of mm. you know all my history. And uh, my husband reminded me one day, he said, you know, you're a workaholic, you can't stop because, you know, I retired 16 years ago, and I'm busy at my computer every single day. Yeah. And part of this um, impulse from, from childhood to, to strive, to always strive something to, to please my parents, I think I'm still trying to please them. Yeah. And, and make them happy. And maybe they're looking down somewhere and feeling happy. I think they are. I'm sure they are. So, so happy. And and it, this was such an honor. I feel really lucky and grateful to have the opportunity to have you, Modern Immigrant. I feel like I can keep talking to you. I love hearing those stories. And it truly inspires me. And it truly gives me hope. And I hope other immigrants can feel the same way. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Vera. I'm so glad Jackie found you because... <laughs> I loved speaking to you and I'd love to read one of your stories one day. Yes. You, you, you come from Caracas, right? Yes. Yeah. And I, I share Caracas, a little bit. I'd love to hear it. I recently somebody proposed to interview me on my own podcast. So I would love to do that episode and share it with you so I can share my oh, story as well. Do. Please let yes. us know. Yes, that sounds amazing. And I love writing as well. So I really connect with that. And we have a book club in the podcast community. So mm-hmm. that's why I'm really always excited to share books and interview authors as well, because I know the listeners are going to appreciate that. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so, so much. Yeah. It's been thank enjoyable you. speaking with you. Yeah. Thank you one more time. And I hope you have a great day. And thank you, everyone, for listening and watching. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Very much.